Heute wird es richtig cool, denn heute habe ich Dan Harvey im Interview, der der Head Marketer hinter Passion.io ist und es erfolgreich in den letzten Jahren geschafft hat, dieses Softwareunternehmen auf über 10 Millionen pro Jahr Umsatz zu bringen. Und wir springen wirklich in alles rein. Ich frage ihn über die besten Funnels aus, wir reden über die besten Ad Creatives, wir reden darüber, wie er es wirklich geschafft hat, das Unternehmen so schnell zu skalieren und vor allem reden wir darüber, was man beachten muss, wenn man in ein Softwareunternehmen erfolgreich skalieren will. Wenn du also ein bisschen an Marketing interessiert bist und vor allem auch an Performance Marketing, dann solltest du dir diese Folge unbedingt bis zum Ende anhören. Ich habe selber fleißig mitgeschrieben und jetzt wünsche ich dir ganz viel Spaß mit der neuen Episode. I already had like Matthias on my uh, podcast and we talked about a lot of the technical side, which is interesting, but I think as a fellow marketer, I'm a little bit more interested into the marketing side and growing a software company to 10 million. I think that's a huge accomplishment that you achieved. And I think there is a lot more room or a lot of more growing that you want to see in the future. Um, Do we want to start with like, what are you actually doing with Passion.io to give a little bit background and then we jump into like marketing? Yeah, sure. So Passion.io is a software as a service um, and we help creators to launch their own mobile app um, and we help them to grow and monetize their audience with that. Yeah, oh, they're perfect pitch. Love it. <laughs> so. I think at some point for everybody who wants to have the backstory, I'm a little bit selfish today, they can jump into the interview with Matthias because I would love to know then how you started the project. And I think you said before that you were very performance based, that you everything most of the time scaled the company through performance marketing. How did you get started with a project like that? How did you came up with your funnels? How did you came up with your um ads and stuff like that can you talk us through like the strategic approach that you took to get to maybe to the first 1000 clients that you had or customers yeah i'll start with how we got the first customer because like that's that's always the you know that's, that's <laughs> a it. huge challenge yeah um his name was preston we called him the king um and i remember <laughs> the moment we acquired the first customer i think yeah. um for people listening or watching like the What I think the mistake I see a lot of people make is that they don't focus on how to monetize the thing. They just think about mm -hmm. the thing. And the reality wow. is that you need money to make the thing good. So whatever project it is you're working on, and no matter how big it gets, the only way you can really make it bigger and better is by making money and using that money to, to improve the thing, um, especially software. Software is extremely expensive to build. Uh, and, and there's a reason why many of the biggest software companies in the world have raised billions with a B in funding. And that's because they need that money to make it good enough that people are willing to use it. So, um, to answer your question, we thought very, very early, almost before the software existed, to be honest, about how do we actually sell this thing? And, um, we started first as an agency where we said, okay, we don't have any software. So let's first just like do our idea as a service and use like other tools. And then we said, okay, done for you isn't very scalable. Let's do done with you. And we did like a coaching program and taught other people how to do this again, not really using our tools because we were still building them in the background. And then we launched the software and, um, with them and we, that we were able to build with the money we generated from that first, first step. So, Where do you want me, do you want me to go into like, how do, like, how do we actually build the software funnel or do you want me to, to even go before that and talk about the agency and the coaching stuff? Love the software funnel. I think this is the part Matthias covered. I think the agency part very good before, but to start and launch the software funnel would be very interesting, especially yeah. what you're saying. I think a lot of people think about the software and how it does look like and that you already think about the numbers and that it should be profitable and stuff like that. Yeah, I would love to hear that, that side of the story. Okay, yeah, let's do it. So, um, The first thing is no one knew who we were when we first started, which is the situation most people are in when they first start something. Um, and we didn't have a lot of money. And so we had to, uh, I mean, and that's also the situation most people are in when they first start. So no one knows who you are. You don't have any money. Like, what do you do? Um, what I would not recommend to do is like come up with some 
idea on how you're going to market this thing and then like execute on that much smarter is realize that other people have marketed stuff before and, um, and they've figured out what works and what yeah. doesn't work and find something that is both working. You can figure out why it's working mm -hmm. and you can model, you have the resources mm -hmm. to model. So back then we found click funnels, um, were running, was running back then a webinar yeah. called the, he called it the perfect webinar, uh, Russell Brunson, the, one of the mm -hmm. founders of click funnels. Um, so it was working. Uh, we could figure out why it was working because he also teaches courses on how to make it work. So, so that was easy. Yeah. And then we could replicate it because all you need to build a webinar is like a, a laptop basically. And so yeah. that's, that was our very first funnel. It was like modeled word for word, slide for slide on something that was already proven to work. And did you have like no customer at all? You had like this proven funnel of click funnels. Okay. We should do a webinar. You yeah. got all excited. You're lining out this webinar. And did you, did you test it in somewhere like to a warm audience or was there really a moment like ads are going online? You have this funnel and the first client is signing up. We had no warm audience. Um, it was, it, it was, the, <laughs> it Oof. was, the, it was the running ads thing. Look, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that everyone should start like that because um, what That's I've come tough. to realize yeah. in the yeah what I've come to realize in the in the years that have passed and also ads have got more expensive is um, actually it's really good to build up an organic audience first because you can for free you can figure out what's resonating with people and what's not but I, I didn't think about it back then I also didn't have like patience I think to do that. And we didn't have much money, but we had a bit because we built up this, yeah. this agency. So we had at least enough money to start running ads. Um, and yeah, so, so we, we ran webinars, um, on a Thursday, the very first one was like 6 PM on whatever Thursday it was. We ran ads Monday until Wednesday, uh, until Thursday at like 3 PM. And then we tried to get people to come to this webinar. I think we generated like 30 leads. I think 10 people showed up or. Yeah. something in that region. And then I did this whole two hour webinar. And then at the end, I realized that everyone had left after like five minutes. So like the, oh, really? yeah. So the one hour 55 of me, like jumping around being like <laughs> crazy. Um, there was zero attendees the whole time. Shit. Yeah. Um, so that was my first one. I realized the show up rate was actually worse. It wasn't like 10 out of 30. It was like, uh, I don't know five out of 50 or something. The show up rate was pretty bad. It We realized bad. That, yeah. that most of our customers were in the US and we needed to do, to do a, uh, no one was awake at 6 p.m. where I was in the world, which was in Berlin. So I had to do the next one on the following Thursday at 1 a.m. So 1 a.m. till 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that for, I think, seven weeks in a row, making zero sales per week. Um, and seven, then, seven weeks, but you were committed and going strong and let's see. Yeah. Because it was a, like, what else are you going to do? It, it was a proven funnel that someone else is making work. Um, yeah. and, and we wanted to succeed and like the only way to, to, to not fail is to not give up. Right. And then, and then week number eight came around or? Yeah. Week number eight. And I can tell you it was like December 2018 and I was in a Christmas market and I'd done my, the, I, the day before I'd done this 1am till 3am, like this webinar number eight, whatever it was. And I was in a Christmas market with actually a couple of colleagues and I was like, oh, we did the webinar yesterday and I kept refreshing Stripe. And then it came in Preston, our very first customer, oh, no paid us a thousand dollars and we were jumping around in the Christmas market. <laughs> going wild um we called him the king we said we we're gonna like devote our lives to helping this this guy like achieve all of his goals and um yeah, yeah and it went from there that's crazy how much experience did you have before with like online marketing did you do this stuff before like for with the agency you had some experience i would guess on that level but before that did you have like i don't know studies in this part of of field or how how did you came along with all that experience um 
No. So I'm, my background is I'm a creator myself. I'm a musician and um, I, I play the drums. And when I was 19, I dropped out of university to pursue my career as a musician, joined a band, did quite well, has an album in the charts in the UK, um, but still couldn't really make any money um, or not enough in, in the end to live. And so after four years of touring the world, we couldn't make the numbers add up anymore and we, and we stopped doing it. And, the, and actually that was the thing that made me think like there's, you know, we had quite a lot of fans and we had like an album in the charts and whatever, but we still couldn't earn money. And I was, I, I wanted to figure out why, why that was the case. And also like there was a lot of my friends who were in bands and whatnot, who, who had the same problem. And I realized that what I've realized over the sort of 10 years that have passed since that is um, most people don't have the tools, information and mindset to make this stuff work. And that's what, that's the problem we're trying to solve with passion. So as I was exploring that, I met my co-founder, Matthias. Um, we, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to create a platform where people can monetize their passion? And, um, and that's where it started. And, the, and like I said, the reason we started with an agency is because you don't need anything to start an agency. You just have to have, you, literally, I just sent a thousand emails to people who I thought would be a good fit to monetize their passion. And I said, yeah you know, we will do this for you and we won't charge you anything. We'll just take a percentage and, and, um, and we started there and we just learned on the job sort of thing. That's really cool. And I think you're one of the cases that I heard from like in this German bubble from transferring from an agency or also a coaching program to software. I think there are not a lot, a lot of people that are willing to do this step because I think it takes a lot of complexity and money and I think a long-term horizon, but you did it and it's really cool to see that it's possible to do this transformation. Yeah. It's really hard. And so you got, yeah. Sorry. You give us some, some of the, of the stuff behind the scenes, because I can guess that software is pretty, pretty hard to, to start and grow. Right. Yeah. And I, and honestly, like what I've learned is like, it's also not like every business model has pros and cons. And there's some great things about software, like really good margins, recurring revenue, high multiples on your valuation, um, easily exitable a lot of like other kinds of businesses are harder to exit so there's all sorts of reasons why software is a great business model but there's a lot of downsides as well it's like really expensive to build really hard to do well um it moves extremely quickly and um and a, a bunch of other things so an adoption is hard like getting people to actually adopt it is difficult um, because it's a mm -hmm. diy thing usually rather than a done for you thing which is a lot easier to get people to adopt um, the transition from agency to software as well is another one that's really hard. And it took us like years, um, because one thing is making money. The other thing is making no money and costing a lot of money. And then you have to try and like focus your time on the thing that's not making money, but, but you, you, you need to balance Eventually that. Because if you make take some your, money. Yeah. Yeah. And if you take your attention off the, the thing that's making money too much, it won't make money. Right. And so this balance was very difficult. <laughs> so you, you've come a long way to, yeah, to make it happen. And it's really cool to see that it worked. Like, um, what did you learn along the way? Like, I think there is a misconception in the market, what you said, like you're running ads, you're having a funnel, you have your offer, you have your core offer for maybe a thousand bucks or something. And I think a lot of people think that you make then a lot of money. But I think what we can, in most cases, can agree on that if you go break even with that, you are totally fine. Was that also your case in, in your terms that you tried to go break even with the funnel or did you even make some money with it? Uh, we, we aim to break even with the, with the funnel upfront. Um, I would say we're even now yeah. like taking some loss on, on the initial sale, mm -hmm. um, partly because ads get more expensive and harder partly because we've scaled up a lot, so it gets more expensive. And partly because we have, of course, like a software business, we have lifetime value that we then make money down the line as well. Um, but yeah, in general, it's very difficult today and will only get more difficult um, to make a performance marketing funnel um, break even or profitable. It's, it's really tough. Yeah. And the cool thing is you said that this funnel is still live today, right? Like after 
a couple of years now now since you launched it or right right yeah we've done so the webinar we did 12 li or 13 live versions then it was like converting well enough that we could automate it and then we did three automated versions and we're on the third automated version but this third one has been live now for a couple of years maybe two and a half years or so and um it's making sales every single day like we we're spending four or five k a day on running ads to that funnel and it's and it's like working still oh that's interesting oh i gotta ask that is there a difference in in terms of content between a live webinar and an automated webinar um what do you mean by content like do you mean like uh Like in terms of the presentation, did you adapt anything from the one that you did like 13 times in a row or did you take the same presentation and just put it onto an automated webinar software? Give or take, it's the same. When it's live, you of course can interact yeah. with the chat. Um, we run it on Ever Webinar, So it, it's like a kind of feels like live thing, which I don't love to be honest, but it does work and, and that's always the challenge. Um, but we have, what we have is we have live chat um, mm -hmm. on EverWebinar, which shows the chat that happens in real time with other people watching that automated version and also mm -hmm. the historical chat that happened at that mm -hmm. time. And, um, and so I, I still encourage a lot of engagement in the chat, even though it's automated Got it. because like, People don't want to just like consume something. They want to like do something and that gives yeah. a lot more engagement. Ooh, that's really good to hear because I'm also like, I'm in a mode right now to do once a week, a live training to yeah, get the presentation right and stuff like that. But I'm always in the situation that I have the feeling that people are getting smarter and smarter and they realize if they are like in an automated webinar or not, I really, especially on LinkedIn, I, I think the people that are on there, they are so smart that you can't fool them anymore. But the same thing is, I think if you frame it maybe right and you say, hey, this is like a recording or something, yeah, maybe you can still get this stage that you don't have to do it every week, but you put it on like uh, autoplay and can relax a little bit. But that's interesting to hear that this interaction is also a, an incremental part of the success, I guess, right? Yeah. What we're exploring right now, and it's not proven, so take this with a pinch of salt, is um, what, what if we open up an automated, uh, like a, a video that, that we, we say it's not live, but we only open it up for a limited time. And so, mm -hmm. because the, re the reason why live works or fake live is the same reason that you watch a 90-minute football game, but you only watch the highlights if it's happened already. No one watches something that's that long if it's not happening right now, or yeah. a, a, a lot fewer people do. And so if there's no urgency to watch it, people just don't. And that's why we're thinking about opening it up with a deadline. Um, and yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So this is the one funnel that is still working today. And that is really cool to, to hear because I think Dan, a lot of people are, I don't know, they would do a presentation or webinar for three times and it doesn't work and they're like, okay, webinars doesn't work for our offer or doesn't work for our company next to the next thing we do i don't know a challenge funnel or something and that is really cool to hear from you you did it like seven times yeah seven times in a row with like paid i would be like Phew, that's that's a long way to to get it right but you also have over the years a second funnel right that is even more interesting today or bringing even more people into your software company yeah Yeah, I mean, we're a bit unique. It depends on who's listening, if it, different types of products. But as a software company, of course, some people yeah. want to get like educated first and that's the webinar. Other people just want to see like the product and do it. And so we have what we call the SaaS funnel, which is just direct to, to the product. And um, that, that drives more scale than the webinar and typically also drives higher quality customers because our webinar is targeted for beginners and And therefore, you, you have a lot of people who don't yet have like an audience or content to put in their app. But the software funnel is usually bringing in people who've got a little bit more experience before they join. 
Yeah. Ah, that's cool to hear. And like messaging in terms of like ads over the years, did you have like, did you have like observed what kind of dimensions or of ad creatives worked very well? Do you have like do this education? Because I really like this video that I saw on your website, like always with this comparison, how expensive an app is and also that a website doesn't bring you anything like as a creator. Were these like unique like creatives that came out over the years that went very well or what was like your winning formula over the years for the ad creatives um yeah good good question i think it comes down to a few different like pulling a few different strings together um none of which by the way is like me or anyone on my team being a genius that just comes up with it from scratch <laughs> but i think Pure like testing or Kind, yeah, part, partly testing. So one is like what I said in the beginning is look at what other people are doing that is successful mm -hmm. and model that, figure out why it's successful it. and model it. Um, so a good example there is like our very first ad was me trying to be like a genius. And I, I thought, okay, I've got a cool <laughs> idea. I, I took one of these like head scratchers. Do you remember these things? They have a handle yeah, 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 yeah. You put it on yeah. your head and it makes you feel amazing. So I picked up one of these things. I picked up my phone and I filmed myself saying like, this is how good it feels to launch your own app, right? That was my, that was my first ad and it, it. and it completely flopped. It had like a crazy high cost per lead. And, um, and I went, okay, no, 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 don't try and be the genius. And I looked at what was working and I found Sam Ovens had this ad at the time that was like, um, it started with a picture of him with a weird hat on that said like, um, and it was with this really attractive woman and it said, what's the secret? And you're like, that's grabbing yeah. attention, right? What's the secret? And then it's like yeah. did, that he shared with all these people that made him this much money that blah, blah, blah. So he, he had this format for the ad. We just copied the format. Yeah. We didn't copy the content, but the format. And it worked 10 times better than this stupid head scratcher thing I came up <laughs> with. Um, yeah. So, so thing number one is like model what works. Thing number two is um, the moment that that um, Preston bought our first customer. I phoned him and I said, "What did I say that made you want to buy?" Right. Cool. He said, yeah. "Oh, you said this and this and this," and that became the first breadcrumb. Right. The first breadcrumb where I went, "Okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that in the next training." Someone bought in the next training. Laura picked up the phone, Laura, what did I say that made you want to buy? That's the next breadcrumb. So the second thing is like, speak to your customers all the time. Um, and then the third thing is, um, uh, is it, I mean, it's partially speaking to customers, but it's like, we get a ton of comments on, on ads. We, um, we have like our community, uh, like we have, we see what our competitors say. So it's a lot about just like seeing what is, what's really resonating in the market and like what wording people are using and all that sort of thing. So I guess it's like speaking to, but it's more like observing what's happening. But I love the idea to call the people and really ask for like the, the ideas or the arguments or the things that you said that made them to buy at the end, because I yeah. think in most cases as a marketer, it's always wild guessing. And if yeah. you just talk to the people, you get like the real data And this yeah. is something that I really will, yeah, I think I will test also because yeah. I don't today, I wouldn't know why people book an appointment. It's always like, ah, oh, you, you have an idea what it is, but really to call the people and to build your marketing around that, that's really, mm. yeah, Dan being a genius. <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, <laughs> and if you can teach people who don't buy, that's great as well, because then you say, why didn't you buy? And then what's crazy is they'll often say, oh, because it doesn't do X. And you're like, what? It does. But yeah. we didn't explain it well <laughs> enough, right? And so, uh, yeah, this is mm. this is good. And do it as quickly after the presentation as possible if it is a webinar or whatever, because then the wording is in their head. And otherwise, um, they would forget it, right? Next day, yeah. they wouldn't yeah. be like yeah. Yeah, have it on top of mind. Yeah. yeah. But you you were really like this is something I think people are always like this. Or do we do like image ads or do we video ads? But from what you explained, you were really like fast invested into doing video ads. And when I see your stuff today, I'm also like, you really have like a cool look and feel and also very cool video ads. Um, was there like a strategic decision behind there or did you just saw like different video ads that were working very well and you just modeled them? 
Uh, a little bit the latter. I have to say we already had the agency where we already had a video editor, so it made it easier for us to create it, video ads already. Um, the other thing I, I maybe forgot to say it before about pulling the strings together is, of course, like your own results, right? Another example of like um, we, we just found that the phrase, <laughs> I, I can't remember how we came up with this. I think it was a, like a, it was almost like a typo or something in the beginning. But the phrase, your own app equals freedom, question mark, like your own app equals yeah. freedom. It's not even grammatically correct. Um, but this, I don't know, combination of words, and it was so short, just like worked. You could put it on anything, and it just like worked better than if you didn't have it <laughs> on that thing. So always following the breadcrumbs of performance as well. Um, and, yeah, we, ha we now, now that we're bigger, we have thousands of video creatives, and we have quite a – quite a complex system on how to actually analyze ads that we can analyze the the hook the headline um oh, the call crazy. to action and on yeah. image ads we can also test <clears throat> the hero image uh the headline and a few other elements of it and we can pull together you know there might be five ads that have one thing in common and actually all those five worked but you didn't realize unless you look at the data that it's actually that one thing in common that's really helping the performance so that's a bit more advanced, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. But this is woof. That's really interesting. I think if you get these these data over the months or over the years and really put together like the puzzle and create like the perfect ads where you get like the most uh, ROI on these ads, that's really really cool to hear. And I think video ads also not a lot of people I think are have a lot of self-esteem to do them and i think mm. if you do it really good and you have like uh the the video editor and stuff like that you really can stand out in comparison to to other formats if you look back like i don't know how many cu customers do you have like today from your from your learnings from starting from your first king who bought how would you do like what would be the shortcut today to get to this level again like i don't know then your your company is gone and you have to start over and have to bring a software company again to this level would you do it like in the same order with the same funnels or would you do something differently if i was starting in 2023 i think it is different than when we started in even 2019 2018 when we started running ads for for the software um It's got more expensive. It's got more difficult. Um, the competitive landscape has changed. I think um, we under, like, if you ask me, like, what mistakes did we make? Um, I think we underinvested in brand. Um, and okay. a lot of companies overinvest in brand and they think, like, oh, we'll just do something really <laughs> beautiful and everyone will just come flocking to us. And we didn't want to make that mistake. So we were like, no, screw that. And, like, Honestly, for the first like 3,000 customers, we barely had a website, right? Like if you went to passion.io, you'd be like, what is this weird blog? Everything was hidden in funnels, right? So yeah. we, you know, we really, really underinvested in brand. And, and, and I think that um, you, like that, we're still a bit haunted by that today because we are actually by numbers, the number one app creator for, app builder for creators. Um, But there are probably a few players that are perceived as bigger because uh, they they invested more in brand. And that, of course, helps them with direct traffic and word of mouth. And then that brings down their customer acquisition cost. And then it gives them like a, a competitive edge on how to scale. So uh, I would invest more in brand if I was starting starting tomorrow, I think. That's really interesting to hear because I have the feeling that the people that have longest time in their life done like performance marketing are always coming to this conclusion at some point, damn, we have to do something brand and organic. And the yeah. people that have done like organic for the longest time, and I think I, I calculate myself to that, I'm always like, well, I got to do more, perf more performance. And I think when we talked before, you were like, yeah, okay, what's your numbers with this funnel? Like, da, da, yeah. da. And I, yeah. was, <laughs> I was ending the call with you and I was like, Ha, huh, maybe I should have a closer look to the numbers after all. Dan has yeah. a point there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really cool to see that this is something that you realized. Who are the biggest players in your market? Is it someone like Kajabi or who is who is doing the same offer? Because I wouldn't know anyone that does like yeah. almost the same thing as you. Yeah. And that that's 
most people don't, to be honest, because um, because yeah. it, it is still uh, an industry in its infancy. I have to say, there are competitors popping up left and right, and most of most of them look very similar to passion and so they're very much learning <laughs> from learning from us in the way we learn from others ah, the- you are now the guy who gets modeled yeah damn it's happening yeah. it's definitely happening um yeah <laughs> um yeah some some are modeling and that's great others more into copying but you know that's copying, okay yeah um <laughs> So, so in terms of competitors, I mean, look, there's the big old, like we call them, they're kind of legacy players like Kajabi and Thinkific and Teachable, and they're really focused on online courses and knowledge entrepreneurs. Um, and, and you don't get your own app and, and you do often get your own brand, but only partially. And the mobile is always branded like with their own brand. We are really focused on like mobile first, um, branded apps Mm -hmm. and, um, in that space, there's like Mighty Networks. Um, there's one called Uscreen. Um, there's one called, uh, well, Vimeo have a, Vimeo is obviously a huge company, but they have something called OTT, which is like um, oh, really? a product they have on the side where you can launch your own app, yeah. So so there's there's a few players and there's some smaller ones as well um, popping up all the time, but um, yeah. it's, it's early. I, yeah, I mean, and I assume there are not a lot of people that like, play performance mic- uh, marketing like you do or do they no. also know how to do that stuff no but they've invested more in brand and and so there's okay. there's um again there's pros and cons you know and, but also a lot of them are heavily funded um and so i have to mm-hmm. say like um if you can if you can crack something that's very cap- a very capital efficient way of getting customers early and you can invest that money in building the thing and making it better, then that's a, that's a big competitive edge. And um, I think we're the most capital efficient in the market. I mean, I will never forget this. I think it was a vlog of Russell from ClickFunnels. And he was like, I think they were hitting the numbers of Infusionsoft. And he said in this video that this was really their advantage, that he still kept going, launching funnels by himself and was not this management guy that didn't know how to acquire a customer on a profitable basis. And I found this so interesting because this hero story was also so attractive. Like we are fighting against these companies that are funded with like millions, not even like I think billions. And they took over the market by storm because they know how to acquire a customer that these huge companies never learned, I guess, right? Yeah. You, yes. Uh, um, and the best marketers, no matter how like big or senior they get, in my opinion, are, uh, are, are always able to do that. I spoke actually yesterday to yeah. the head of marketing of Typeform, she, uh, Patricia. She's oh, an unbelievably crazy. talented yeah. um, individual. And she can do performance marketing, brand content, PR events. She can run all of that stuff herself. Um, and, uh, and when, yeah. And, and she has like a great team around her who does various things, but when there's like a big initiative that needs to a big new innovative thing, she like drives it herself. And uh, she does a fantastic job. So she yeah, jumps I, into the campaigns. She can do yeah. like creatives and stuff. Yeah. Ooh. And I think this is maybe really like the war of talents with like the software companies, I guess, because these online marketers, I think, especially in Germany over like five or eight years that I'm in this market, I really, I think I met like everyone. I think I'm really at this point that you drop a name and five other people say, oh, I met him. He's a great guy. And I'm like, yeah. oh, the loop is some kind of closed. Yeah. And it's yeah. crazy that it's such a skill set that is so unique. And I think yeah. on an international level, there are some more people, but not like millions of, of us, right? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. So Patricia spent 15 years at IBM learning like every single um, arm of marketing and they, yeah. uh, and, and I think they put her through school and, and whatnot. And then she went out into the world and, and yeah. And, and then you've got like the type forms of this world who are, who are after Crazy. talent like that. Right. So it's, it's tough to, to acquire, um, you know, talent that strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have two topics that I'm super interested. You said that you want to invest and I think you already invested some more money into brand. 
what are your like learnings after the first first months how do you even approach this are you like okay we we invest more we do more content we we try to set it up but is there also this performance then who is like what yeah. are we tracking here what are we looking at do you have some metrics or something that you're looking at yeah i mean our goal is is to drive a higher percentage of our new customers direct meaning they're not attributed to a performance mm -hmm. marketing channel but rather no channel meaning they've heard about us through a friend <laughs> or they yeah. i don't know watched some content online and just googled it so that's the main KPI but that's a lagging indicator right so how do you drive that you look at like the leading indicators um and we've also looked because you know because we already have an asset which is the performance machine or engine we've looked at ways of kind of like first of all supplementing that um and so to give you an example we run most of our ads on meta and um mm -hmm. up until honestly six months ago you would see this ad from passion.io or from passion dan and you would click it um but if you click on the profile sorry it would take you to a profile that no one had posted on for like a year and that's not building trust Cla right classic yeah I yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and so um we so we said okay as a first investment in in content let's just produce content for instagram and facebook so that when people go from the performance marketing where we're already running getting eyeballs it adds some trust and improves the conversion rate of this because then ROI focus Dan thinks okay there's an ROI to this content even if it doesn't you know grow our audience or drive new customers it's going to increase the conversion rate of the stuff we're already doing so we're trying to think a little bit through that stuff and um and in the meantime because it's always a case of like spinning plates like doing it plus plus yeah. building the engine at the same time um we've been growing the team so we now for the first time have like yeah. a a brand and content squad of like six seven people um with different skill sets and backgrounds and we now have a head of brand growth and so we've just got to the point where we now have some people to actually do this stuff because it was just me for some time yeah oof yeah pretty impressive are you sometimes looking back and saying like it's pretty impressive what you've built or are you like what's the next what what's the next chapter for you and the company um i think this isn't going to be very aspirational so if you're, anyone's thinking yeah, of yeah you're a guy guy too yeah <laughs> well yeah so if anyone's thinking like oh i'm going to be like really happy when i when i build up a, a 10 million dollar business <laughs> I, so look for me i think in i've been doing this now six and a half years so almost seven and and i think i've never felt like i've arrived anywhere and that's also because we have invested every penny we've made back into the business and therefore you know it's not like a lot of people build up the these kind of information businesses and once they hit seven figures and certainly eight figures they are just like they're they're set for life right they can chill yeah. so we've invested everything back into the product so it's a real long play and it's a high risk game and um it probably won't turn to nothing now because we're big enough that like um uh, you know but, but it's um, still it's a kind of gamble it's still a gamble it's still a gamble yeah. because uh it could be the next shopify it could also be like that we're acquired by some company and um by the time all of the investors get everything and whatever it's like not the biggest thing so i've no i'm i'm always like okay we need to get further faster and um you know i'm i'm really proud of what we've built in six and a half years and then someone like jasper.ai comes along uh, and we know the team there and in two years there are 1.5 billion dollar <laughs> enterprise value and you go and you're like damn <laughs> yeah yeah you go okay you started later you overtook us in like two months and then you and you just raised 150 million okay and so you know there's, there's always a bit that. of like there's always a bit of comparison as well and that's not the healthiest thing but it's it's yeah that's my truth for you then i it's i think a lot of people that are seeing that or listening to that can relate to that because i think most of the people really like to think ahead and think what's like the next uh, milestone 
And it's cool to see that you, yeah, still playing this game with like having the risk that you don't know how it like ends. As long I think if you enjoy the work and as long as you enjoy the projects, I think you you're okay. Do you have like a plan to I don't know to hit at some point I don't know 100 million and maybe along the way something happens? Are you like having a long term vision in this in this area or is it like really we're trying to exit it at some point or? Or is it really like we try to keep growing and see what happens? Um, the main thing that's exciting for me is like the product vision of creating the ability for people to solve that problem I talked about earlier, that people can really earn money doing what they love. And they have like an amazing product at their fingertips, their own brand, their own, um, they can monetize their own individuality that to me is like so exciting and we're so far away as a not just passion but as a as a global community we're far away from that yeah. being the reality i think still um but i think it's going to happen so that that's the thing that i find really exciting um the second thing i find really exciting is that like it, this is like a really long game of chess where you're also learning the rules as you go along and the rules are changing and it's like it's such a crazy journey um which I think is really cool that we get to do that and, and how much we learn and grow along the way. That's probably where I am more proud is like when I go, wow, I didn't know this two years ago or whatever. And what will I know two years from now? And then um, building something big, like commercially big as well. Like um, money is like oxygen, right? You need money in your business. And the more you have, the more you can do. And so like building something where if we could get to like a billion dollars of ARR, like imagine what you can do with that, what you can create, it would be insane. So <laughs> love it. It's yeah. yeah, it's like world domination plans. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Can you share a little bit like if we're going to the end of the interview, can you share a little bit how your your daily life or struggles or projects look like today what your head is focused around right now because i can imagine maybe if you have your team with branding maybe they're mm -hmm. like set up and doing like a good job you have your funnels that are working right now what are like your projects that you are thinking on right now um great question uh so there's a certain part of my time which is like um kind of like leadership and management um, there's a certain part of my time, which is about right. like, yeah. yeah. And then a certain part, which is about like moving bigger projects forward. So I'll give you like this week, what my priorities are. One is that we want to go more into JVs, joint ventures and find people with audiences who can promote passion. So kicking that project off, building a, a list of potential partners and then, um, contacting them. The second thing is we want to launch new paid channels. And so um, starting to research which paid channel is going to be the one where we have the highest conviction that it would work. Um, I'm not completing all these things this week, but it's a few things I'm, I'm starting to work on. Then yeah. the third one is like more about around pricing and packaging and how do we monetize, um, how do we imp increase LTV basically through, through, um, what we include in different packages and how we upgrade people and, and move people through the funnel and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the bigger th swings that I'm working on right now. Um, and yeah, it's probably half my time working on the big swings and half working on management stuff. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that because I think it's also the struggle keeping operations going and doing leadership and giving the team like everything that they need while thinking about these strategic projects that you have to do to keep the company going. And I think joint ventures, I'm, I'm yeah, excited how that works because I think it could be really, really interesting to, to get new people with like warm audiences into your app. Yeah. Dan. Thank you so much for anyone who's listening and wants to monetize their career being a creator. Yeah. Where does he or she has to go to learn more about you? Yeah. So just go to passion.io and um, we've got a lot of resources on there. Case studies. That's always the first question people ask, like, can I see an example? So we have case studies. We have the webinar, which is basically where I walk through how to launch an app and then you get a special deal deal at the end and stuff. So, yeah, check it out or just follow me on Instagram or TikTok or whatever you want. There will be a lot of organic content right now, right? 
there's a lot of organic content right now <laughs> teaching. Um, we want to be the thought leader for, um, we want to be the go-to hub for creators to learn how to engage and monetize. So we create a lot of content around how to be successful as a creator. Love it. Love it. So everybody who's listening or watching, check it out. And thank you very much for your time, Dan. Thank you.